Okay, welcome everybody. Uh, we are so lucky today to have a wonderful guest speaker talking to us uh, about one of the key stages of, of, of management. And we're going to get right into this. But today we're we're joined by uh, John DeFleece, who is he's you know been a chef, executive chef. He, he teaches. He's been a professor at uh, at a university and at a very uh, fabulous culinary school that I worked with them at. And we also have a pretty great, fun, we had a fun history back uh, a couple of decades ago. We worked at a couple of different hotels. And uh, so John and I go way back and we're just lucky to have somebody in, in class today in this recording uh, with some, just some really rich experiences on what, what we're gonna be focusing on today. So John, welcome, man. Thanks for coming in. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Perfect, perfect. So before I, I start asking the questions, um, or I guess, you know what, I, mean, I can just maybe have you give me your background first, and then when I ask you the first question after that, we can kind of uh, dial it into specifically how we're going to connect with those stages of market of uh, management, rather. So, John, if you could just, again, welcome to class, and uh, I'm going to call you yeah. John, but I know professionally, I always called him Chef the Police, but uh, John, if you could just share with me some of your, some of your background in the industry, sure. restaurants, and in the classroom. Sure. So um, I'm uh, from Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Go Packers. Um, born and raised there. My father and uh, mother, both immigrants. Um, I started working at a very young age in a restaurant. Started washing dishes. That was my, or actually busting tables was my first position in the dining room. And I was in a car accident and my face got scarred and messed up and the um, owner of the restaurant said, you can't bust tables. You got to go back into the kitchen because you're scaring the customers. And I said, okay. So I started washing dishes, fell in love. My face healed, short story, but my face all healed up and uh, I fell in love with the kitchen. So I worked my entire high school career through the kitchen. After I finished um, high school, I went to Milwaukee Area Technical College. I studied there um, it was $2,000 for an associate's degree in 1994, and I worked for all these, or not work, but all these master German and Swiss um, chefs were teaching at this technical college. After I finished the technical college, I went to the Culinary Institute of America, studied there in New York for two years, finished Culinary Institute of America, came out to Arizona where I worked with uh, Joe at, uh, or uh, Professor Joe at um, Hyatt Regency in Scottsdale. We worked together there. He was in the fine dining restaurant and I was kind of in the uh, belly of the beast, if you will. The money maker, <laughs> you're in the money maker place. Yeah. Gonna... yeah, so we were, it, I was cranking out a lot of food there. Um, it, it was a tough job and I'm gonna kind of touch base on why I left that job, but I wanted to move up and, and do my own thing. Um, so I became an executive chef of an Italian restaurant, and I was an executive chef of a, like a fine another fine dining restaurant. And then um, I, there was an opportunity for me to start teaching. So I got my, I started teaching just as a, an associate at Le Cordon Bleu. And when I think about my career, I think and cooking and everything I've learned, I think I give the Le Cordon Bleu a lot of credit because as I started teaching there, I was surrounded by tremendous um, uh, employees and chefs and managers and everyone taught me a great deal. Um, as a young chef, um, they, they kind of molded me into this, you know, uh, person. And so, um, Spent 14 years at Le Cordon Bleu. I was the chef de cuisine of their uh, one of their restaurants. After um, Le Cordon Bleu, um, my wife and I said, hey, maybe we should uh, move to uh, Europe and uh, spend some time over there. So we went, we went to Ireland. We worked in a bakery in Ireland. We worked in the south of France. Um, we worked in a hotel there, came back. Um, I did some private chef work. I'm private chef for Max Domi. He uh, played for the Arizona Coyotes, the Montreal Canadiens. It was really cool uh, working for a um, professional hockey player. And I said, maybe I should get back into um, teaching again. So I got a job and I'm currently teaching at the University of Delaware. I um, ran their fine dining restaurant, the Vita Nova restaurant for three years and I'm teaching some other classes right now. 
and then I, I did my master's degree with uh, um, Joe and um, I've got a bunch of certifications. So that's, that's me in a nutshell. Yeah, you, man, you got a fabulous resume that just kind of goes all over the world. That's it's, it's so much fun to hear hear you talk about it. And, and uh, some of those things, little tidbits, I, I actually didn't didn't know about. So that's wonderful. Hey, but you, you know, I, you you might have gotten into a car accident, but you got the beautiful face back. So <laughs> that's on that. We, the, I'm not sure if you mentioned, but we also uh, we also taught a Lacord on Blue together. Thanks to you, I got that job at Lacord on Blue. So yeah, you, yeah, yeah. That's right. So we taught at Lacord on Blue. Um, and then, uh, yeah, we talked for a long time at Lacordum. We were both in the, in the restaurant, right? Yeah. You were there for a, a few years more than yeah, I Oh yeah. And, um, one years. thing I didn't tell you is you, cause you covered me. I went to Afghanistan. That's right. Three weeks. I cooked in Afghanistan, um, right. which was like the highlight of my career. Like it, it, it was amazing. I was cooking for the troops. Yeah. Wow. F-14s like circling the bases like protecting us and like it was just it was just fantastic but thank you for covering that ship for no, me we, we got to do a whole other discussion on that and that's exciting because I remember you giving yeah. me that full story but uh yeah just a great career John you had and, and you're still a young 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 guy and uh I know you got a lot more aspirations and, and goals and stuff like that but uh again thanks for joining us uh, yeah yeah of course my pleasure so again, we're talking now. We're talking about, I guess, the umbrella. We're talking about management, uh, but we're going to key in on directing and motivating, which sort of falls underneath that um, that leadership uh, piece. But just to to let the students know, can you see that, John? Can you see that? Uh, yes. Yep. Yeah. So just you know, basic functions of management. Now, this class and these students, we're going to get into the theories of the theories of management first. Uh, and then eventually, you know, you'll get to this uh, uh, interview and we're talking about the stages of, of management. And this is important because these students are going to design a operations plan, a food and beverage operations plan for a legitimate restaurant. So this is all good stuff. But as you can see here, planning and decision making, I think that's actually spelled wrong up there. I just pulled this off the internet, but planning and decision making and then organizing, you know, that's what the manager, what managers do, managers or leaders uh, do. Uh, then, of course, the, this leading at six o'clock here, which is sort of what we're getting into when we're directing and motivating from the plans we have, right, from the organization that we created, there's, there needs to be some kind of direction, uh, you know, on the ground, day in and day out, grind, and that's what John's going to get into. And then, of course, the controlling piece. The controlling is when you're actually, <clears throat> you know, gathering all this data uh, on on how you're doing, you know, whether it's a profit and loss statement or numbers throughout the week and scheduling and then you're evaluating how you're doing and then at some point you're going to um, make changes make improvements and then continue around that circle again so I just want to show them that briefly so man let's get right into to what I'm hoping to get out of you uh, John so thinking about thinking back and you have a lot a pretty incredible career as you, as you just described but thinking about your jobs you've had in the industry in the past and your early career up to this point you know, I'm sure you've experienced some kind of direction or motivation uh, mm -hmm. from a uh, superior or somebody that was in charge of what you were doing, but can you just maybe give me, give us a, maybe a positive example where you yeah. give direction yeah. or motivation and then, you know, and then we want to see the other side too, maybe talk about a bad example. Right. So uh, my first one is I worked for um, this restaurant called Pandles and Bayside. It was a, it's in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. That was my first job and the owner they had uh, the owner of the restaurant, they owned the restaurant for, I don't know, maybe a hundred years or something, maybe not a hundred years, so, but maybe 80 years. It's generation to generation. This was the third generation. The owner of it, James Pandel, was a graduate from the Culinary Institute of America, and it was a 350-seat restaurant, beautiful restaurant. We do a thousand covers for uh, Sunday brunch. Um, it was right like in a forest, really nice, and they motivated me there, like the chefs motivated me, the management motivated me. Um, they were really encouraging. So as a young person, um, I kind of didn't really get a lot of encouragement in school. I wasn't big into sports. I wasn't the best academically, um, but in the restaurant world, it was like, yeah, go get it, whatever you want to do. Like if you work hard, you're going to, you know, be praised and we're going to help you. 
And um, James uh, Pandel was kind of the person that told me about the Culinary Institute of America and said, you know, this is a great school. This is where I went. This is where you should go. Um, so a lot of encouragement, a lot of motivation there. And for, like I said before, academically and sports wise, I wasn't the best as, as a younger person and I didn't really have any direction. So this was like, you know, very motivating to like, people were asking for my input. And I'm like, well, what do you think about this? Or what do you think about that? And I was like, I don't know. I mean, no one's ever asked me to like, you know, to help out in a business oper uh, operation, which is important to involve your staff, get your st staff involved, even the smallest people. Oh, well, you know, the, even the dish station, maybe we should organize the dishes this way. Yeah, I think that's a great idea. Giving them that positive reinforcement encouraging them and making them enjoy their job was critical to me. So, so, so that's, that's my positive direction. John, John, it sounds like it was in the culture, sort of embedded in the culture before you got there. And um, can you just maybe give a, like a specific example as far as how they told you to get things done? Was it a system that they had in place? Or was it an impressive system that worked that you just learned how to do it? And then as far as the motivating, was it just a pat on the back? It sounds like they empowered you too. A lot of empowerment right. were really uh, uh, they had trust and faith in your in your opinion. Right. Uh, maybe can you just talk so a little more about that? Yeah. So it's I mean, it started in the dining room. I started busing tables and there were just, you know, like busing tables in the restaurant, 350 seats in the restaurant. We're turning the tables two, maybe two and a half times. So we're looking at about 700 covers. And you had to hustle. I mean, you had to run as fast as you could to get those tables turned. And you know what it's like, I mean, just in the weeds. Um, and uh, they empowered me by just saying, you know, this is your section, make sure you control this, you know, like hundred seats. There was only three of us, three, three bus people. Um, so they empowered me by let, letting me do that. Then after I did a great job, they, they gave me positive reinforcement. And then the system was, once I got into the kitchen, you, I started in the dish station. I worked in the dish station for about a year, maybe nine months. A position came open in the pantry. They moved me into the pantry. And in the pantry, they trained you how to do everything and start working with the knives and, and start making breads and whatnot. And then from the pantry, they moved me up to a hotline. And then the hotline progressed from various, you know, I'd work with someone through various stations until I was strong enough to run the station by myself. So it was a good rotation through the kitchen. In addition to that, the um, chef there was like a master butcher. And they this is back in the day where you get whole tunas in, you know, and we'd be working on the bandsaw and cutting meat. And, you know, nowadays you're getting sides of salmon and whatnot. But it was fantastic just seeing all these things. And then in, in addition, we had Sunday brunch and that's where I kind of shine Sunday brunch. I was in charge of the omelet station. I'm talking about a thousand covers, one person on the omelet station. Oh my gosh. And I could just crank that stuff out. So they liked my system. They liked the way I was organizing it. They gave me praise. So it was a great, great. Sounds great. like a lot of, sounds like a lot of survival. Uh, <laughs> thing my, to have this for a start. long time, my career was just survival. Yeah. I remember cutting onions, you know, like hey, we get done with Sunday brunch, it'd be like three in the afternoon. And chef would say, why don't you cut me four or five gallon buckets of onions? And I was like, man, all right. And so I would cut onions and then I would go home and take a nap. And as soon as I fell asleep, I was back into the world of cutting onions. Just <laughs> I'd have to wake myself up and say, it's over. It's over. Exactly. So, John, do you think that place is still open? No, actually, it was, um, he bought another restaurant in downtown, but they sold it like a couple of years ago. Yeah. So, but it's been around for a long time. Yeah. Great example. Yeah. So a negative example, you know, roll right into this. So chef, um, executive chef, who was an alcoholic. Yeah, I might know who this is. Yes. So he was very abusive, like, not like physically, but just mentally. Like he was abusive to everyone. And what happened was, is the culture of everything because of his 
I mean, I, I don't know if abusive is too aggressive, but he was, he had instilled a culture of just negativity. I mean, at all, I mean, we would just work as hard as we can. You just work as hard as you can. That was it. This is your life. Get used to your life. And what happened was, is because everyone was so negative, it kind of like burdened down on everyone. And it was just really just this, like you're walking on pins and needles. Um, thankfully, I had been yelled at for probably five years before that. So it didn't really impact me, but I could see people coming into the staff situation. I could see managers being belittled. I could see, you know, one, I have a great example. He was kind of grooming me to be a kitchen manager. And he took me over to the ice cream bin and the ice cream bin was in charge. The front of the house manager was in charge of it. And he said, look at this, look at, you know, they're not, this is horrible. It's not clean. He goes, I want you to yell at him and I'm going to stand over here and I'm going to watch you yell at him. And I was like, it's it's not my style. I'm just not a, yell. I'm like, I, I like to think of myself as like being a good person and being happy and, so like, I was like, hey, I was like, the ice cream <laughs> doesn't look so good. I was like, can you clean it up and this and that? And he came, you know, he came up to me afterwards and he was like, that's pathetic. You got to get tougher. And I was like, I, I don't know. It's just not my thing. So um, that's not my management style. Um, and he, you know, like for him, what he needed to do, like what it taught me was, first of all, I'm. I'm not an alcoholic, but don't drink on the job. Take your job serious, right? I mean, I don't mind if you taste wine or something like that, but it should be a serious job. Um, don't be little people. And if you do, if you need to manage people, do it in private, do it in an office, um, but do it, do it in a way that's positive. Don't you know, neglect this person for a year. Don't train them, don't give them motivation and then just rip right into them if they're doing something wrong. And then the last thing it taught me was let people have time off, right? Let them know their schedule. You cannot, it used to be that we never knew our schedule until Sunday night, and you know your schedule for the following week. So it's important for people to time their time off and to be with family and friends and community. Otherwise it's just too overwhelming and you'll just burn out. So that, that's what it taught me. Yeah, yeah. I, I'm sure you could go into a lot more detail, but I, I get you. And, and uh, you know, sometimes you might work for, and I work for brilliant people, brilliant chefs that were brilliant technically what they did, what they put on the menu, but not so good at, uh, you know, leading and motivating and wanting to, and sometimes, you know, you, you just stay there just to soak up all their knowledge. And then at some point, there, there's no reason why you don't want to stay there. Um, right. No, I think you described that very well. Um, and um, we all, it's it all, but it is. It's good to have those bad experiences too, because then you kind of have you have you can you can sort of contrast and you learn from what you, you learn about what not to do, right? Right. Yeah. Oh, fantastic. You want to treat people that way? No, no, no. So I guess the core of what we're talking about here is leadership, right? But we're really trying to key in on directing and motivating. So why is why is it why is directing effectively or being an effective um, manager of directing and telling people what to do and but then also motivating them why is that so right. important in the restaurant industry the busy restaurant industry right well so when we talk about effective direction we're kind of looking at like vision unity consent communication follow-up all these things that are you know make up what the bulk of um, effective direction is so for me like you know, and I'm sure you're going to get in more detail and I'm sure you've discussed this before, but like you have to have a common vision when everyone's coming into you're hiring people, everyone should understand that this is what we're trying to accomplish. This is the vision. This is the mission. You know, we want to be, you know, the best food, the best service, the best people. Um, so what is that vision? Right. And make sure you communicate that effectively with the people that you're hiring. Um, when you're talking about unity. This goes back to professionalism. I don't even know if I talked about professionalism, but professionalism as being positive to people. It's not talking behind their backs. It's not throwing people under the bus. It's doing the right thing, cleaning up after yourselves. If there is a problem, you're communicating it. Um, we're talking about consent, right? 
um, how much do you work? How much is this person expected to work? Now I've been in, you and Joe, you've been in the same situation where you're working a hundred hours a week. You know, that's just too much. It's too much because that's where you get into the situation of people are maybe drinking too much. Maybe they're, um, you know, drinking too much coffee. They're, you know, wired all the time. That's just too much for someone to work. So when you talk to your staff and you say, we want to have the best restaurant possible, but you must have a life outside of the restaurant a little bit, right? So you can have that community. Um, in terms of communication, this is a good thing. You need to communicate with your staff. And I remember at Le Cordon Bleu, I would get a review once a year. And I said, so for a whole year, you're giving me feedback once a year. And that doesn't work. You need to communicate all the time with them. I like to communicate written, um, orally, and then projects. So when they're talking about written um, communication, what am I doing? What, how can I be better, right? Write it down, right? Tell me about it, right? Give me positive reinforcement. And then projects is another thing. I like to have my staff work on projects. Now the project could be to innovate something, to come up with a new idea on how we can prepare the salad, maybe innovation in terms of how we set up our station, maybe innovation in terms of how we're managing people, but come up with something, right? And then follow-up, you have to follow up. This is the hardest thing with new employees. New employees don't get enough feedback. So when you're managing people, you know, you need to say, hey, you know, this is three weeks in, we need to talk, you understand the vision, you're doing great, this is what you could do better, and just keep following up, following up, following up, even test them, right? It could be a fun little test, it doesn't have to be something that's like, going to freak them out, but follow up always, make sure they're on the same path as you, make sure they know that vision, make sure, you know, everything's being communicated, and make sure they give you feedback as a manager. As a manager, they may say, hey, you know, this isn't good. You know, I don't understand this or whatnot. I give a classic example. Um, when you're um, working in a restaurant, the lowest paid person is the dish station. So the dish station, oftentimes they're not the most motivated people. But if you come up with a system in the dish station and you have like a checklist for them, they know exactly what to do and how to perform that job. And a lot of times you hear a manager yelling at the person saying, hey, you're not doing that right. That's wrong, right? And you say to yourself, well, I wasn't trained to do that. So look at the three fingers are pointing right back at the manager because the manager didn't effectively train the person. If the manager effectively trained the person, they wouldn't be having this conversation. Happens with my wife all the time. I say yeah. to her, hey, I wasn't trained on the uh, that's good. cleaning yeah. and she says, yes, you were. So, but yeah. anyway, that's, that's just a, a little bit of uh, my effective direction. That, that's great. You know, um, as far as directing and the importance of it in a busy restaurant, you know, what you said, one of the things you said, um, as far as echoing and, and making sure that your understanding, their understanding is the same as your understanding. That's such a common issue and problem. And that usually, if, it's usually what it boils down to if someone's, you know, I guess they could just be arrogant and try not to, you know, just to act out and not, not do the job. But more, more often than not, it's just they, they, they're doing it this way and they're not exactly sure how, how you want them to do that. And that's, so that's why it is important to have them echo back what you're telling them to do and have those systems in place. That's, that's man, you, you really keyed in on some, some hot ones there. Um, it, it all comes on the communication, right? I mean, it's as far as directing. Now, can you just, I know you, now you started with Unity. Can you just repeat those? I don't have anything I'm taking notes on here to show the students, but can you just rattle off those, those again, like Unity? They were like, I think three or four. So uh, vision, Unity, consent, communication, and then follow-up. Beautiful, beautiful. Now, as far as motivation, I'm kind of shifting over to motivation. I know there's some crossover here, but how do you believe motivation plays a role? Right, so I like to think of the restaurant as like playing sport. Right. So when you're running a restaurant, we're all wearing the same, you know, front of the house and back of the house, we're wearing uniforms, we're ready to get into this because it's a physical sport. You know, it's almost like sports, like we're trying to like be the best we can be. Um, we can serve the best restaurant, um, serve the best food. 
Um, so I like to, to motivate them and say, you know, this is our sport. This is what we're doing. This is what we're training to do. Um, and we're working together as a team. So I motivate them in, in that way. I motivate them with um, being proud of their successes. If we've had a great night, if we've earned a, um, you know, great revenue, if we've gotten a written up, something like that, um, you know, talk to them about it. Tell them about it, right? Always be positive with them. Um, if you're making a ton of money in your restaurant, management, whatever, you need to start giving people some bonuses, right? And a bonus doesn't have to be like, five thousand dollars whatever a bonus could be as small as you know uh, a bottle of wine it could be that they could come to dinner with their wife it could be oh we got some tickets here maybe you should go see this community show but but something you you need to, like this the the days of you you know just um not taking care of your staff and just aggressively um taking all the profits to yourself um it needs to be shared and it doesn't have to be in uh, crazy. And then you need to incentivize them. Um, I think um, a good way to do that is, you know, um, have games or goals that people can um, earn time off or, or whatnot. Um, so team sport, definitely we're going to attack it like the Green Bay Packers because we win the Super Bowl and then be proud of them, share the wealth and then incentivize them with with. You know, like a lot of times people say, well, why are you a college professor? Well, there's a lot of incentives to be a teacher and to be a professor. So it's the, the salary may not be there, but the incentives, you know, in, in terms of benefits are there. No, I'm glad you paralleled that into sports because, you know, even if you haven't really played a, an organized sport, I mean, you can kind of connect and relate to that because it is all about esprit de corps, sort of getting everybody on the same same um same page and, and and not not just pushing them like you know some of the earlier theories of management where it was just you know you're just a a, a cog in a, in a wheel and there's, right. there's a lot more social you know social uh um, points there and a lot more behavioral type type of things there that, that make an effective manager that's you know really successful so sporting uh, sporting um sport teams and athletics is a great parallel you know, I, I also agree with what you said, too, when you were talking about that one time a year where you're actually sitting down in a formal setting and talking to your employee. That's that's just crazy. And and, and I remember when, you know, places like I think the Hyatt thought it was, like, you know, or it's changed. But a lot of other places and companies thought that doing it twice a year was, was, was better. And it's of course, it's better. But I've always liked Charlie Trotter. He that, That's the first time I actually. Uh, read about it was when Charlie Trotter's book, he was talking about doing it weekly. And he had this uh, system where he would have a, like a piece of paper and he would just, you know, sit down and he called, I think he called it like the 90 second talk with every one of his employees down to the dishwasher. He would like just sit down and it could be all positive. And usually it was, but a lot of just meeting with them once a week and, and not too formal, but where they're, they're actually looking and seeing uh, and hearing about his opinions on how they're doing. So but you think, you know, like, I mean, uh, both of us have had, you know, a lot of experience and we think we know everything, you know, as like a manager, you're like, well, I, I mean, I was, I've been a chef for over, I'm, where I'm, I'm approaching 30 years. I think I know everything, but you don't, you, you definitely don't, you never know it all. And these people that spend eight hours a day working in a station or serving or whatnot, they understand the small nuances better than you ever can. So you need to pull that information out of them to make them better and make you better as well. All right, absolutely. Yeah, we, we have a fantastic book that we're using in class called Setting the Table by Danny Meyer. And it's just fantastic. I mean, it's, uh, I, I, we use it as our textbook, but it doesn't read like one. It just talks about his journey through uh, the industry and getting attracted at an early age to, to restaurants and, and uh, him just turning into this incredible entrepreneur and, and a lot of what he talks about. I mean, I, I'd say about 90% of what he's talking about in the book. Uh, I'd say about 90% about what he's talking about in the book is um, on just being kind, you know, treating your treating your guests and treating your employees the same way as is exactly how you would want to be treated. And he gets into that very early and um, He's, he, was, he also gets into when he's hiring people. I mean, he's not so much looking for their technical skill, but he's looking for 
you know, uh, how even keeled they are, what's their, what's their temperament like, you know, can they deal with the pressures of, of just craziness in restaurants? And Ed, that's a great book. I'm not sure if you, you I know you've heard of Danny Meyer, but have you ever read that yes. book? That yeah. book? No, no, I'd like to. Fabulous. You, um, you, when you talk about, um, when you talk about like treating people right, like, I don't know when, I think I was probably like, probably not until I was like 28, 29, that I was like, started saying please and thank you to people. Like it used to be like, do this and do that. And, but like one day I just woke up and I was like, can you please do this or thank you for doing that. And like started being appreciative of everyone. And um, it like kind of was like one of those aha moments, like in terms of management, it's like, you know, managers say like, well, I give them a paycheck and that's the please and thank you. It doesn't work that way. How hard is it to say please and thank you? How hard is it to be positive? How hard is it when you are running a restaurant and you establish your vision and you say to them, you're going to come in, we're going to make eye contact, you're going to shake my hand or you're going to, you know, we're going to be positive to each other. We're going to talk about how, you know, like the challenges that are coming and what we can do to to face them. Um, um, so that's like critical. It's critical because I've been, we bought, Joe, you've been there before where you're just in this situation where everyone's just negative and just heads are down and you, you can't be that way. That's all goes back part of that vision. Never get angry. Try not to get angry. I mean, I know it's a human emotion. Everyone gets upset, but try, you know, if you are upset or if something goes wrong, don't speak about it, you know, handle the situation, fix the problem, take a minute, take a breather, you know, do some yoga, right, or whatever you got to do to calm yourself down before you react to that person. The person who made the mistake or whatever happened, they didn't do it on purpose. They weren't, if you've trained them, right, they, they you know, it was a mistake and it just happened. Um, you know, it wasn't like they're blatantly trying to do it. So if you take some time and you realize that you've trained them properly, they didn't do it on purpose, it just happened, you're probably going to react a little bit different. You know, if something gets screwed up, you know, you get a VIP table and spending a thousand dollars and something gets screwed up. Hey, that's part of life. You know, this is, this is like, like talk about a team sport, you know, when you throw the, the football to the end zone, if it's like a couple inches off, they may fumble it. You put uh, some uh, bread underneath the broiler for an extra three seconds and it burns it or the fish burns. It's the it's same, same principle. So Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. You know, what you brought up too is you can't do that. You can't manage that any, uh, any, any way anymore as far as, you know, managing with, with fear, uh, especially in this day and age. I mean, we have some industry partners. I'm sure you do at your university and, and we're always talking to them. We have advisory board meetings and, and man, the hot topic right now, even pre-COVID, uh, but certainly now, you know, we're we're kind of getting back to work post-COVID, is is just HR, human resources. It is so hard to find people to work, you know, that are you know, exactly what you're looking for. And I'm talking to a GM at a country club here, Longboat Key Club, and some other uh, clubs and hotels and resorts and restaurants, and some of them have, you know, 40 unfilled positions on their website, you know, in their, in their uh, organization. And, and uh, it's a constant struggle right now. It's such a hot, it's such a hot topic right now. It's human resources. And so the reason why I'm bringing that up is, man, once you get them in, gosh, you want to train them properly, orient them properly, and you want to keep them and you want to find a way so they don't get poached and they don't get, because it's very competitive, not only with your brand and your business and your menu, but with your, with your employees. Um, so it, yeah. And, you know, I think a lot of what you said, too, is just leading by example, you know, setting the tone, creating that culture. So anything else you want to add, John? It's been brilliant, man. Anything else you want to add? As far no, as, uh, I mean, it's it, for me, obviously, you know, it all comes down to being a good person. Just just be a good person. You know, think of, you know, like employees kind of as your family. Not I mean, they're not your family, but treat them right say good things to them, encourage them, be positive. That's the best way. Um, I, I, you know, just like you, you like to be treated, right? Exactly. Like to be treated. And I think that's the key um, to really running a ni nice establishment. 
Um, and uh, it's always worked for me and I've always gotten great successes from it. And then when you're going through, like, if you're like interviewing and you're in a, a, um, like a trying for a management position, make sure that you tell people when you're going through the interview process that this is your philosophy. I mean, you can adopt my philosophy or, or your professor's philosophy, but talk to them about your philosophy right. on you want to treat people right. You want to do the right thing. You want to motivate them. You want them to understand. You want to push them, but you, you know, in a, in a positive way. So um, that's, that's it for me, really. Great stuff, man. That's great stuff. And, and, uh, you know, and you just cut to the chase right there too, and just get right to the core of it. And the, the minute you sit down and start talking about hiring them, you're giving them your philosophy. That's so important. Um, yeah. It's been great, John. Thanks so much, man. This is going to be wonderful for the students to listen to and for us to archive for this class. And I thanks for your time. You're busy, man. Thanks, John. Yeah.